Thank you very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for organizing this um, segment. Um, this is joint work with um, Cedric Dupre, uh, Vic Pony, and um, John Van Rienen. Um, so I'll just um, jump straight in. Straight in. Um, so the question we want to ask here is whether there are any um, spillovers um, that are uh, generated by um, superstar firms. Um, so I'll be more specific about what we mean by superstar firms, but um, you know, just think about successful, successful firms. Um, and one of the motivations for this is that, as, as um, I'm sure you will know, there's been this increasing dominance of, um, of large firms um, in the US and Europe and, and other countries. And you know, this has raised concerns about you know, um, you know, monopoly power, and you know, and, the, and you see, you know, the antitrust cases trying to limit the size of these um, big firms. Um, so you know, the, the literature on this is mostly focused on the potential costs, um, and this is um, for um, large firms generally. But despite these fears, um, government often encourage one particular type of superstar firms, and they're multinationals. Um, so you know, there are lots of countries, both developed and developing countries, that spend a large, large sums of money to try and attract um, FDI. Um, but um, you know, so they, in doing this, this policy rationale assumes that multinationals also generate spillovers to domestic firms. So it's well documented that you know multinationals are, are bigger and more productive and um, you know pay high wages and you know other other um, positive um, um, premiums. But um, you know there is by you know wanting to pay for them to to come to a country, there's this presumption that they're also going to generate spillovers. And um, you know, uh, on that, um, you know, case studies are often positive, um, in showing that um, that that is indeed the case. But the general econometric studies are, are, are more mixed as to whether the um, you know the foreign direct investment multinationals are actually providing these spillovers, and most of them have used um, industry level data. Um, you know, one exception is the paper by um, Alfaro Reno and Fischer. Uh, um, on um, cost recon data, where they actually have the firm to firm data with the sales and, um, and they focus there on um, foreign direct um, investment and they do find indeed that they do generate these positive spillovers to um, domestic firms. Um, so just pops out the of my anyway, uh, <laughs> pretending to read it. Um, so, oh, that's a while. Well, that's <laughs> No, that's right. Um, okay, so in this paper, um, we are going to ask whether um, superstar firms um, also generate um, spillovers. So in, in this, the way we're going to define superstars, we're going to include multinationals, but we're also going to um, have just large domestic firms that are not multinationals, um, and also um, exporters, whether exporters, you know, whether you start selling to an exporting firm, whether um, you would um, get um, positive um, spillovers. Um, and so, um, and the thing is that in order to do this, um, to ask this question, it's like, is it, being a multinational per se that um, you know transfers the, the the spillover benefits, or is it just you know being a, a, a superstar? And you can't really address this question in uh, developed countries because there are there, there are no domestic uh, superstar firms, right? So so you, you know you don't have that uh, variation. So one one of the the, the the big contributions that I think of this paper is that you know um, thanks to the National Belgian Bank we have this um, data on firm to firm transactions with you know the sales um, all along the production chain and with different types of firms so that we can see you know is it really just about being multinational or you know is it about you know being um, a superstar. And then on top of that, we're going to look at the mechanisms that are driving the, the, the spillovers. Um, and so the, the, the literature on this has focused on, um, you know, the kind of more um, obvious intuitive way that, you know, the, um, the superstar firm, um, well, in the multinational, in the, in the previous literature, um, transfers, um, you know, 
know how, you know, because of our technology, you know, capabilities, and things. We're going to look at an additional mechanism driving the spillovers, and that's looking, we're going to look at um, whether, it, you know, the multinet, the supercell also acts like a, um, kind of a dating agency. So that, you know, they also introduce um, the, their suppliers to other uh, other potential buyers in their own network. And we find that, that that's an important um, channel as well. Okay. That works. Work now. Okay. Um, all right, so in terms of the literature, um, I think I've already given you kind of a broad um, overview of, of where we've been in, so I'm just going to uh, move ahead. This is like the... Oh, it's okay, good. Um, okay, so the data we're going to use, uh, as I said, is from the National Belgian Bank, and this has the universe of um, transactions um, on the value of sales um, uh, um, between all buyers and sellers relationship. Now, in developed countries, there like um, Japan has um, uh, um, the firm's firm um, sales, but not the value of the sale, just the indicator. Um, the US has like the top ten buyers or something, whereas this has the universe of, of all the all the transactions. Um, and then we merge that with you know balance sheet data, other data to get like firm characteristics. Um, so you know we we estimate um, TFP. We'll have you know um, the firm's exports, imports, capital, you know all the um, characteristics that you want. And then you know to um, we have the um, foreign direct investment <laughs> survey so that we have both inward and outward. And then we have the trade, um, the, the customs data as well. So we merge all that in order to to get um, our identification. So, um, okay, so how am I going to define a superstar? So, as I said, we're going to um, look at three different types. Um, so, we're going to look at the multinationals. A lot of the literature on the multinationals just looks at inward FDI. We also look at outward FDI and we find the results the same, whether they're inward or outwards. Um, and so, we, we find that as um, in, in, one, in, in one of the um, groups. Um, we also look at exporters here. Here we're only going to look at non-wholesalers um, because that's where we, you know, we don't think wholesalers are the, the type of um, spillovers that we're thinking about in generating. And then for the large firms, we're just going to define those as the 0.1 percentile in terms of sales distribution in, in, in Belgium. Um, and what we're interested in um, a serious relationship, like, you know, if you're just going to sell, you know, one dollar to a superstar, you're unlikely to get the kind of um, benefits that we're thinking about. So, you know, just as a cutoff, where, you know, for our base one, we use 10 percent that, you know, is, the, is based on a new relationship that where at least 10 percent of your sales go to that um, superstar. But we do a whole bunch of robustness so, you know, to make sure that that's not, you know, kind of a weird, weird cutoff. Um, and so, um, so we're going to focus, uh, so a firm I, who starts selling to a superstar firm J, X main T. Um, and as I said, we're focusing on a serious relationship and we're gonna look at a 10 year window around when the relationship starts. So we'll look at, you know, what the firm, how the firm um, looked compared to the control group, um, you know, for all period, five periods leading up to the beginning of the um, relationship and the five years afterwards. Um, and our control group is going to be um, firms that firm I that never had a, 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 a relationship um, with the with, with the um, superstar. And we, in all our regressions, we include firm fixed effects and also um, four digit um, industry um, fixed effects. Um, I start by by year yeah, industry um, times year. And so you know, so we're going to take out any kind of like big demand shocks or anything by, by industry. We're just really comparing the firms within the same industry, um, of comparing ones that sell to superstar um, relative to the ones that don't. Um, and um, as I said, with TFP, we um, we're going to use many different measures, <laughs> and you know, they, it doesn't matter which measure you use. Um, so um and so what we um i think i forgot okay so what we do find and I, I think i've got to tell you the, the punchline before we continue is that um you know the superstars do indeed generate uh, positive spillovers um for around um eight percent by the end of the the uh, period that we look at um 
and um, the they're very very similar in magnitude. It doesn't matter whether it's a multinational, an exporter, or um, a um, uh, just a, a large domestic firm. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like there's anything special about it. The firm being a multinational that's um, driving these spillovers, but it's more that you know these firms are successful and they um, they're able to um, generate you know know how. <clears throat> Okay, so here's the, the baseline results. So this is so as we're going to do one superstar at a time. So this is um, links to multinationals, um, and so this is the event study where zero is the year before. So this is annual data. So zero is the year before the the new relationship started. Um, period one, um, year one, um, see one on the uh, um, x axis is the, um, the the year that the relationship starts. So you see that they don't get the huge bottom TFP straight away, but you know, by the you know second and third year, um, if, if you see that you get like eight, around 8% eight of uh, benefit and you see that there's um, there are no pre, pre trends. Um, so, and you know, just to remind you, these do include firm fixed specs and um, industry time to fixed specs of a four digit level. So, um, and then, so we also look at other um, outcomes. Um, so, you know, and the, um, the treated firm also has higher um, total sales. And in the, in the panel C, we net out the sales to the um, superstar, because obviously by construction, um, they, they're going to have higher sales in the year of the, um, the event. So they're, that's netting that out. You see that, you know, they, they do start um, increasing their sales. Uh, to other other buyers as well, increase in inputs, wage bill, and also other buyers as well. Um, so from here on, the next um, regressions I'm going to show you are going to be a little boring because they're going to all basically look the same, no matter which uh, superstar um, I'm, I'm going to do. So here, um, it's a, this, uh, now instead of um, a new a sale, a new relationship with the multinational, I'm doing a new relationship with an exporter. And again, you see a very, very similar, similar pattern. And then here, this is a very large firm. And as I said, I'm defining very large firm as the firms in the distribution of the, um, the 0.1 top centile. So, um, that, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, the, the very largest firms in, um, in Belgium. Um, and then, um, you know, again, you see, you know, the, the same results. So then you might think, well, you know, some of these large firms are probably multinationals and um, or exporters. So are we really getting at that? So anticipating that concern, I've now got a, um, a so, so this is actually just one regression um, where, you know, we allow for different coefficients where on the left panel, um, so we just take the set of the, the large domestic firms and then we say, um, okay, let's find the, the, the uh, superstars that are large, but not don't have any input or output FDI. Um, and then um, we put all the others in the other the other bin. Um, and you see, um, you know, the, the even if, I mean, it's a smaller set, as you can imagine, that you know, being very large and not having any um, any um, not being a multinational. Um, but, you know, we still have um, uh, about 2% that are treated and you can see that the effects are, are, are very similar. And then I, I, um, I do have a robustness where I say, okay, what if they're not um, exporters either? So, you know, just pure domestic ones. And then, you know, we find some examples of, you know, to um, show you that the, the, they do actually exist because some people have a view that there's no such thing as a large domestic um, um, firm, but um, I, I can assure you that there, there is, but I won't, I won't have time to go into all the examples. But um, so that's basically the, you know, the story in a nutshell. Um, and so now um, I will, uh, I'll, I won't have time to go through all the uh, robustness. There are many, many of them in the paper. Um, and, um, but I, I think this one is um, an important one to, to show you in that, you know, is it, um, you know, you might think, well, maybe just selling to any firm, you know, starting a new relationship, maybe it's something about firm I, that they've got some new managers and they just start selling a lot more. And, um, you know, it, it's not that, 
you know, that they're getting a transfer of knowledge or whatever from, from the superstar. So the placebo we um, did here, um, I'll, I'll get you to first focus on the, the left side, is to do the exact same um, strategy as we did before, but instead of um, saying, um, looking at a new relationship to a superstar firm, we look at, at a new relationship to a firm in the bottom um, quintile of the distribution. So, you know, so you start you start selling at least ten percent of your sales to a, a, a small firm, and you know, do you get the spillovers? And the answer is no, you don't. So here, you know, the up the top uh, the top panel is the log TMP. You see that there's no gain. Um, and the bottom one is um, if our other state of sales to, you know, the, what I'm calling superstar here, but it's a non-superstar <laughs> firm. Um, and then when, when I, I, I presented this um, placebo, I talked to somebody about it, um, and they said, well, but maybe the value is not the same. You know, maybe the value of the, it's 10%, but maybe, you know, the value of the sales is much smaller, so you're not compared to like to like. So in the right panel, we um, restricted the, the treated the, um, further by having, um, I don't know what the number is here, because it's uh, hidden, but uh, we, we, we did as well as um, that you have to start at least 10% um, sales. It had to be of a particular value that corresponded with the average in our superstar ones. So that's kind of, a, you know, so then you know, we have to drop some of them, but as you see, you still get some, no, no effect there. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to um, try to make sure I don't put us behind schedule, so I'm going to move ahead. Um, so, so first of all, so now I just want to look at the mechanisms. Um, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but I'll, I'll just uh, point out what the main thing to look at is. Um, so, um, so what we do is um, for, for each superstar, so multinationals here, exporters here, large here, we look at okay um we say so we have the same as the baseline like say for multinational but then we add an interaction term to if the firm is in the top um quartile i think i'll put decile top decile we go oh no it's useful top decile of the um uh, the r d intensity of the superstar um, and the next one is in the um, ICT and then the skill leadership. So just focus on the first three components to start with. And the idea is that, you know, if the firm, if the superstar firm is more R&D intensive or more technology intensive, more, more skill sets, maybe they, they will generate bigger spillovers than an old, a, a superstar that's not. And indeed we find that. So that's this indicator variable. So this is basically one if the superstar is in the top um you know um decile so you see it's a, a bigger boost if you if you start selling to one of the very top uh, superstars um and you know that's the same pattern we have um going across now what's this rc this is what we call a relationship capability so andy bernard and others have stressed that using the um, beach big data as well that you know the the big firms have a you know a skill of acquiring new buyers and you know maybe that's all that's going on um so what we find so we we, we did a um did an indicator um to see if, if that's the, the mechanism that's generating our our tfp result and you see these are all insignificant. So we don't we don't find that. But consistent with Andy, we do find, like we could put log other buyers, we do find indeed that you know if you start selling to another um, superstar, you also get an extra buyers, but that doesn't um, generate the um, relationship capability. So um, then I just wanted um um, almost done. Um, I want to kind of mention this new mechanism that we want to um, emphasize that um, we, we don't think um, we haven't seen explored previously um, in these kind of studies is um, whether you get um, you know spillovers um, from um, you know introducing you know we saw that there there are other buyers, um, but what it, it's not about um, just um 
it, it's not about just introducing to the, the, the firm I guess more buyers, but they actually get more buyers in the network that the, the superstar is in. So it, so even though, um, so looking at this number um, here for the multinational, this is the in-network and this is the out-of-network. So you, you, you might think, well, how do I come to that conclusion on just that? Um, well, what we do is we, we construct the odds ratio, right? So, so what's, you know, I mean, obviously the, the potential number of buyers out there is much bigger than the ones in the, um, in the superstars network. So we worked out the odds ratio and um, here what we find is that the ratio, the, the, you know, the chance of uh, pulling a, um, uh, a buyer from the you know, superstars network uh, compared to a buyer outside is um, is five to one. Um, so the number of buyers increases, but particularly so in uh, you know other firms in the superstars network. Um, okay, so um, I, I'm not going to go through all this because I have to wrap up soon. But I'll just mention um, this would take me probably another hour. <laughs> um, but you know we do lots and lots of um, robustness where you know we we have an IV strategy. Um, we also um, have this new uh, approach called um, using a control function, which uh, I, I really don't have time because it's a little complicated. Um, but you know we look at alternative TFP estimates, alternative definitions of superstars. Um, and then also, um, you know, there's a new, there's a whole big literature about concern of heterogeneous treatment effects and negative weights. We also use that approach, um, you know, um, to, and we don't find an issue. Um, and, you know, one of the advantages of our approach is that our treatment is binary, at, um, staggered, and, you know, we have a large control of, of, of never, never treated. We also look at um, nearest neighbors as well. So um, with that, I. <coughs> Um, so forming a relationship with the superstar firm improves outcomes, TFP, outputs, inputs, um, and survival. I didn't show those results, but we also um, looked at that. And they're likely through both the transfer of know-how and this um, matchmaking dating agency effect. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that um, what, what this um, paper shows is that you don't have to be a multinational or an exporter in order to generate um, these um, these spillovers that local superstars also bring in um, these, these benefits and you know erases I think some very interesting policy um, implications. Um, you know if you know local domestic firms um, bring in as many um, you know benefits um, at least these spillover benefits that we're estimating as as foreign. Why, you know, why favor foreign superstars? Uh, you know, I mean, we, we're not taking a stand on one of them, but, you know, it does raise these questions that should be uh, considered. Um, you know, the barriers to firms to grow, to become, um, you know, future superstars could, could be quite costly to, um, um, to, 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 I'll stop there. Thank you. We're with you in time. Uh, yeah, Mary, thanks for that. There's a lot there, so fascinating. Um, have you thought of the idea of absorptive capacity and that the seller uh, has to be, say, large or and intensive to benefit from these blooms? Um, yeah, so we're going, we, we did. Um, and so in the same way that the heterogeneous um, table that we looked at, where the, the um, you know, the, um, Firms are, um, um, you know, uh, sorry, the superstars are R and D intensive. We're going to do the same thing with the the firm I, you know, whether they're in you know, if they have my skill share, whether they have um, absorptive capacity. So that that's actually probably would have an answer to you tomorrow. <laughs> um, but yeah, we do. But yes, um, I think that I mean, one one of the referees mentioned that. Um, so we. <laughs> uh, I have a clarification question about the definition of superstar. Is this um, superstar for each sector, industry, or this overall superstar? I mean, Belgium is a small economy, so might be the industry sectors can be quite concentrated, 
then if we are talking about on um, the superstar road, is this how you say some particular industry pick up the results? Right. So um so that's a good question. We do actually do big overall, so we just take the whole sales distribution and take the biggest ones, but we we have done it the other way where we do it within industry like that, and it um it gets the, the same results. And in all of these, we do have industry times here effects. So if it is something just about that industry, that would be absorbed in those um, time varying things to base. But yeah, we're shooting with that robustness um, as well. We, 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 we did do it, but we didn't include it in the paper. Very interesting, very but uh, one question just about the mitigation. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess the main threat is that there might be some selection, right? So in the big school high fixed cost of forming a relationship with the superstar, then only firms which which are above some threshold in terms of productivity will start. And then, so you can have completely identical firms, but then one of them gets very high productivity. And so they form this relationship and of course they will also start uh, supplying more goods to other firms, right? Even though it's not causally just a uh, selection thing. So, I mean, maybe it's one of your bus checks. Yeah, yeah so we, we dealt with that in the IB um, and um, and this control function. So I'll just tell you briefly since you asked about that. <laughs> is that we, so we have this methodology that um, I've used in um, a, a JP paper with David on um, match back data where we separate the, uh, let's say, a shock, <coughs> whether it's a, a a firm I shop or a firm J shop. There is banks and firms, but here we've applied the same methodology that's um, firm I or firm J. So what we do is um, we essentially using the whole distribution of networks, we um, we we identify a firm specific shop that's net of um, the supply shop. Right? So it's an idiosyncratic um, sorry idiosyncratic supply shop of firm I. So we actually put that in as a control. So you know, so anything that increases that firm's sales due to what's happening in firm I, net of what's happening in any firm J, is um, you know should be picked up, and that's a, a time varying um, measure. So that does absorb some of the effect, but you know we still get um, you know significant um, positive um, spillovers. And the IB strategy is uh, I won't have time to explain in a couple of minutes, but yes, we we were. And then that is gone. Yeah. Just a quick question. So, it, you, you don't have any other information that allows you to cut into the TFP because TFP is kind of murky. Is it, is it pricing? Is it investment? Is it employment? Um, yes, yeah, so we do. We actually do have um, all, all different outcome variables, and we, uh, we do also estimate markups um, using the, uh, the um, Toluca methodology and also just the accounting framework uh, methodology. Um, and so I just didn't have time to, to show those results, but um, and, you know, we look at um, you know, all other outcome variables. I think it's um, so. So in terms of the, the price cost margins, uh, so the, the the markups go down, but the profits go up. So that's kind of consistent with the idea that this you know the superstar can extract some rents, you know, in return for these you know um, big spillovers that they're generating. But you know, as you saw, they introduced more buyers at higher sales. Um, so you know, so their their overall profits um, profits go up. Question. So, kind of connected to the first question that we had. So, is there any difference with uh, you are becoming that you know the major supplier of superstars or like yet another uh, superstar? So, my understanding is like you know, your kind of criteria is like superstar become your important customer. But I think other thing you can also look at from the same data is like you know, how big I am relative to superstars that you know, in the policy. So, oh, oh, I see. As a share of all other yeah. um, suppliers. So, yeah. so if the sphere were bigger, you could become kind of an important uh, key supplier. Of yeah. So I guess we get at that a little bit um, with um, the, I, 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 I don't know that I'll be able to, to find it, but we, as I'm talking, I'll, I'll try. Um, no, we get at that a little bit no, with um, the, um, 
Oh, no, I think it's gone. Okay. Um, we get, what, what we do is we use different cutoffs, right? So we, so we have 10%, we, you know, that we go all the way up to 50%, and we get very similar results. Um, so we don't think that that's interesting driving it, but we could. Well, that's out of my set. Yes. Oh, you mean out of total sales? No, yeah. no out, out of uh, super stuff cost. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I get it. No, we haven't done that out of super stuff. I, I, I vaguely remember we might have tried something like that, but I, I, I don't, I don't, um, I'll, I'll have to go back and look. The total sales, what is from I sales? Yeah. Okay. I, I All right. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks so much, everyone, for coming to the session. I'm happy to present this paper that I'm going to demand some production and some content of the work. So, this is a great work with a module in the audience. Uh, thank you all from UBC and now the moment of the deep thinker and from the University of Chicago. Okay. So the motivation of this paper is that in the previous research and also kind of connected to what Mary presented right now, for the rich family information production network has shown us that small domestic farms are also connected to foreign market through their connection with other large farms. So few farms directly participate in foreign trade in Belgium, but most farms are actually indirectly importing or exporting through their connection with other farms, you know, to their customers, to uh, through their connection with their customer buyers, customer, customer buyers, buyers, and so So the natural question that comes out of this, which we are going to talk in this paper, is how the short density those directly exporting farms propagate through the production networks and affect other farms in the workers. And ultimately, we uh, so ultimately, we want to know how those shows affect the aggregate market economy. So to answer these questions, we are going to be the We are going to estimate the response of from the input sourcing to foreign demand shows. So in particular, we are going to empirically estimate the elasticity of labor cost and input policy with respect to, uh, to sales instrumented by our uh, exogenous foreign demand show. By doing that, we are, we are going to you know get the estimate of the cost structure of farm. And then we are going to uh, interpret those uh, elasticity to the length of theoretical model that features production networks and labor market. So by doing that, by combining data and theory, we are going to quantify aggregate implication of foreign demand. So let me give you a quick preview of our main result. In our peak analysis, in response to the table change from foreign exogenous foreign demand, first half performed quite large share of the demand to their suppliers. So the elasticity of input positive to other suppliers with respect to sales is almost one, so near complete pass through. On the other hand, if you look at the response of labor related variables, the farms adjust labor cost with the elastic only around one half. So if farms receive foreign demand that increase their sales by 10%, what they pay to their you know, labor, which we only goes up by like 5%, 5.5%. And furthermore, if you look at decompose this response into wage response and employment response, basically both wage and employment response. And, and it's not just coming from like a, you're hiring new workers and more skilled labor. Like a, we also find that like a lot of and crew are at that farm when they receive foreign dimension also experience some wage growth. So farm also increase hourly wage and stay in workers. So through the length of current farm model, this last two points. I imply two things about the labor market. One, farms face a upper slope in labor supply farm in the labor market. And two, uh, farms face a quite sizable overhead in, in their labor industry. So in terms of aggregate implications, so bringing these two findings into the model and do some counterfactual analysis, we find that accounting for these two factors, upper slope in labor supply farm, and considerably more importantly, this uh, fixed overhead cost in labor substantially affect the change in average real wage from foreign demand shows and kind of a similar mechanism also to productivity shows. So, to give you an intuition, so let me kind of give you a quick example. So, suppose I you know, pay, so I, I produce combining my own labor and my purchase from manual. So, I pay for my labor and I pay for manual. And similarly, a manual pays for his own labor and a manual. You know, case you should supply your market. So now I want to know how much I'm exposed to the shock that market receives. So you now if we take our 
finding that you know half of my uh, labor is used for fixed overhead. On the other hand, what I write on the manual kind of actual goods um, more useful variable then out of variable cost that goes into my production, I'm more exposed to manual and more exposed to manual. If I take into account that labor is more useful, it's overhead and what I write on supply is useful variable. So basically I'm talking for this this channel a very market is for how we compute like the harvest from the exposed to shop in production. So now let me get into the detail of the paper. So, so let me first discuss the data that we use. This is kind of you know very much kind of the same as what Mary presented. So we are going to use the data from National Bank of Belgium and we're going to use the data of production network from the B2B transaction database. So that's going to allow us to you know serve the level of transaction between the BAT ID and the BAT ID. So what is really nice about this data is you know, as Mary said, we observe the actual level of transaction. And over you know period of time, so that's going to allow us to estimate our system. And for some part of the analysis, we also combine this with some additional data set from the Social Security Office. So we are going to also combine this uh, B2B data with a uh, monthly employee employee data set from the Social Security Office. This, so compared to the production network data, this is not the universal workers. We only observe sample of 500,000 workers, but we are going to use this information to kind of you know, look at how scale responds to the foreign demand. So before getting into the empirical uh, results, I'm going to briefly talk about the model that we have in mind. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into every detail of the model. I'm going to refer you to the paper. But so today, I'm going to give you kind of a big overview of the model that we have in mind and derive a couple of key questions that are relevant for our deep analysis. So to give you a very quick uh, overview of the, the model, we have a static model of small open economy, version of the small open economy. So, and so to keep things simple, we're going to have a fixed farm to farm network. So we are not, we are going to abstract away from some like, endogenous changing uh, linkages. And in terms of production, farm produce differentiated goods combining labor and input purchases from other domestic suppliers and also import. And farm space up for stocking labor supply curve, which can, can be micro founded by workers to build in preferences. And in terms of preferences for good and technology, production technology, so for production technology, there is a diverse technology between labor and intermediate, and intermediate is aggregated by a serious technology. For the market structure, because farm produce differentiated good, farm acts in a monopolistic competitive fashion, so there is a monopolistic condition in the output market, and farm set price for the, what they sell to the household and also other uh, domestic buy other buyers. And buyer take so so because of that the buyers so households and other uh, customer farm take price from domestic supplier than equal to given and in terms of labor market because farm pays up also in labor supply and farms act as a monopoly in the labor market so that's a kind of you know too much information so this is kind of a quick overview so to give you a kind of brief kind of big picture of farm coffee market farm problem. So farm profit maximization problem in this setup and farm maximizes its profit, which is sales minus you know what they pay to labor and input purchases go to domestic suppliers and also import, subject to a set of constraints, which I'm not gonna uh, like, write everything about, but two key important constraints that are relevant for our you know, analysis today is first farms have farm specific algorithm in labor supply curve with level detection. And then the fixed labor inputs and intermediate bundle that farm needs to satisfy. So given this setup, so you know why are we doing this? So what can we get out of this setup? So let me first quickly write down the first order condition that we kind of like in the standard form. If you take a first order condition with this figure labor input, you know you get some kind of familiar form. If you are you know familiar with markup estimation, you get it. So share variable labor costs are the total sales and given by the markdown terms, markup terms, and also output elasticity with respect to labor. So if you are, you know, so the standard approach in markup estimation industry is forget about markdown terms for now and you know you know, look at the share of labor out of sales and estimate output elasticity and back out the markup term. So what we're gonna do today is a little bit different. So, so we are gonna start from this equation. And totally differentiate this equation. And 
uh, folding all the uh, network parameters and surprise parameters and rearrange a little bit, and we get this equation. So the interpretation of this equation is so left hand side, this is the elasticity of labor cost with respect to uh, demand driven changing from out to because we take uh, take us given the surprise parameters. So this so this is the elastic to labor cost with respect to uh, changing sales caused by some like TFP or demand chain. So what we get is that we can have two objects. One is the share of variable labor, and the other is uh, elasticity of labor supply condition. So to interpret this, let me go over this figure. So this is the illustration of the equation that we just had. On the x-axis, we have the share variable labor out of photo labor. And on the y-axis, we have elasticity of labor of the basic And defined line represent defined uh, labor supply assist. So first, let's start from elasticity uh, infinite, so meaning the perfect competition in labor market. Then basically, there's a one to one relationship between elasticity and share of variable labor. So, if you find that elasticity level cost with this regard to this part, then that's going to translate that this guy half of your labor is used for this, this uh, well, variable. And so, one minus that is here. And in the very standard of that as well, you know, you should get the elasticity level cost uh, you know, to be one, so you get that everything is for variable input. But in reality, when we estimate it, so to kind of spoil, spoil, uh, spoil it, we get something like more significantly lower than one. So combined, so basically that's what we do in this table. So we estimate the elasticity of labor cost output, and we also estimate the action, the elasticity of labor supply curve. And by doing that, we're going to back out the share of labor out of you know, all the labor that can be used. Yeah, so let me skip the intermediate to put side. And so before getting into the ethical result, one last piece that I need to show you is you know, where do we get this uh, exogenous dimension? So now we have to construct an instrument for what we call total demand, total exposure. So we're going to start from uh, the, you know, the kind of conventional technique in the literature, construct uh, what we call direct exposure. So we're going to look at the plausible, plausibility of donors changing while importing one for exporter. So this is kind of CCA instrument. So look for each direct exporter. You now looking at the country product pair, we define the change in total uh, world import demand for export, uh, excluding Belgium. So that's kind of the CCA instrument technique. But you know, the thing is that we can only define this for direct uh, exporter. So what we're going to do is we're going to you know, take advantage of our production network data and construct what we call the total uh, exposure. So, so in the, uh, our first stage regression specification, so this uh, last term corresponds to the you know, total exposure. So this H is a kind of matrix that will like, summarize the information about the production network. If you're familiar with it, this is basically the Leon Gift inverse term. So basically, so total foreign demand shock is kind of the way this sum of all the direct uh, export shock that all the farms receive in the Belgian economy. And that way is determined by the you know, network information. So the nice thing about this is that you know, now we can define the foreign demand shocks for all the farms in the Belgian economy. You know, the direct export shock is defined only for um, less than 10% of the farm, but now we can around regression on the much larger scale, we can define uh, foreign dimension for all the farm in the economy. And just as a quick note, we also include something like industry and fixed affair, complex affair, etc. So that's the specification. And for the remaining uh, 10 minutes, I guess, or a couple of minutes, I guess, excluding the few and day, I'm going to go over the main result. So let me first describe the foreign dimension that we constructed. So if you regress our foreign dimension, so on its this and that. So, so, the, so basically, this is the statistical uh, dependence between the current and the past future foreign demand shocks. So, we find that, like, you know, what we, the shock that we construct is you know, like reasonably close enough to universe. You know, there's no, like, you know, very high time dependence. So, if we use that shock and regress up, you know, estimate our first case, if we regress our third growth on this shock, basically, this is what we found. So left hand side is sales growth, and we find this instantaneous response to the foreign demand that we constructed. So because left hand side is sales growth, 
this one time uh, increase ratio means a permanent decrease in sales. So we find a point demand shock that we constructed about sales like a permanent shock. And the there's only a slight mean rebound after that. So cumulative response of sales is only 76% of its continuous response. So if one received 40 demand shock that increased their sales by 10% this year, over the course of four years, their sales can increase by 7.6%. And we have strong enough of the depth that. And let me show you some uh, release form results. So if we regress the label side variable, label cost improvement average rate, you know, we see a little bit of a you know, response. So average rate response is continuous, but there is some lag response in improvement. And combining that, we see some lag response in label cost. On the other hand, if you look at the response, so uh, input participant, the pattern of input participant pretty much mirrors the response of the So input Active value changing as prior with pretty much one to one with the response of sales. Now, let me show you the second stage result where the magnitude becomes more interpretable and interesting. And because of the lack of response in labor, we report both instantaneous response and cumulative response over the course of four years. So, let me start from this uh, column four. So, given the body demand shock that increased from sales by 7.6% over four years. The, their input positive also increased by 0.8% over the course of four years. So it's pretty much one to one. On the other hand, if you look at the response of labor costs, labor costs only increased by 4.1%. So combining this labor cost response and uh, employment response of 2.2%, we estimate that labor supply is to be around 3.5, which is kind of in the same ballpark with previous studies. And combining this information, going back to the video that I showed up here, this is going to imply that average share of fixed labor is very really close to uh, like, no, 48%. And I'm going to skip this for a lot of time. So, in the interest of time, but, you know, we see some response in wage, you know, wage for stages as well, and that is not driven by our. So we did, we did a lot of extension, SSTV check, et cetera. I'm happy to discuss this afterwards, but I'm gonna skip this for now. And remaining two minutes. So I'm gonna you know, talk about some aggregate indication. What should we care about this elasticity that we estimated? So now we're gonna take into account general equilibrium effect, which we, I haven't discussed yet. So here, you know, let's introduce some other aggregate shocks. Consider 5% increase in foreign time conversion. Or well, by random symmetry, you may want to think of this as 5% increase in the price for imports. So what we're going to do is take our model and compare results across different parameterization of the model. So let's think about you know, the, the same Belgian economy generated by different parameterization of the model. You know, but this, so parameterizations are you know, whether you introduce or not fixed input cost and whether you have or not a possible demonstration. So compare this. So, you know, by the combination, you have four different version economy and keep all the economy with the same shock of 5% increase style and see what happens. So, so the main idea here is, you know, what should we care about? You know, why is it important that we need to take into account this, you know, fits sharing in paper? So here I'm showing you the top, the share of so out of funds, Fixed input cost and variable input cost. What capture is coming from your know, domestic labor but foreign input? So coming back to going back to the model, so you know the funds are buying from domestic supplier uh, input and you know, you know, and they also have their own labor. You know, considering all the network connection, eventually you know, your input come, you know, comes from directly indirectly from your own labor or somewhere from abroad. So now what we're computing is an identity, you know, what's the total share, you know, whether you, your inputs are coming from abroad or domestic labor. Out of your fixed input, so basically you know, most of the, you know, your fixed inputs are coming from domestic labor. And only like you know, 20 to 20% are coming from uh, foreign inputs from input. And on the other hand, if you look at the variable input cost, basically variable input also composed of both domestic labor and foreign input. And if you take into account that labor is mostly used for fixed input, basically that's going to further increase your dependence or exposure to foreign input in terms of a variable input cost that you use for your production. So, in terms of aggregate response, so again, the kind of final result that I want to show before closing. 
So here I'm showing you the checking average journal rate in response to 5% increase in point time. And I, I'm showing you four, four bars, and these two bars uh, represent the parameterization of the Belgian economy where we account for fixing uh, inputs. And these right two bars are not account for fixed inputs. And this dark color represents introduced in public competition in the labor market. And this lighter one is you know, where we have public competition in the labor market. So what we find here is basically accounting for these two factors, or well, you know, rather not accounting for fixed inputs and in public competition in the labor market, basically understate the decline of real wage. So the you know, kind of workforce model that we commonly do, basically don't, don't often don't really incorporate these two margins. But what we find here is basically accounting for these two margins seem to be constantly important. Especially, you know, no, not that much for public uh, in public competition labor market, but especially for accounting for fixed inputs in labor, seem to be very complicated in Poland. For accounting how much you know after real way changes in response to the uh, aggregate shock. So to wrap up, so kind of to reiterate the main points, so we find the Belgian accounts passing on last year point demonstrate to their domestic suppliers with pretty much complete after. But if you look at the labor response, farms seem to face up also in labor supply up, and farms <laughs> seem to have a sizable fix overhead cost in their labor. <laughs> so of course there are some limitations, you know, we didn't take into account entry and exit of farms or you know, kind of a northern response of farm to farm linkages. Yes, still what we found here, you know, the measurement of fixed cost, you know, whether they are paying, you know, imports are paid by uh, labor seem to have a quite huge implication for determining the efficiency of the equipment in a wide range of economic models. Yeah. So let's see our presentation. Uh, we have a couple of Thank you, Doshi. We'll be on time. Yes. So we can open the discussion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, you said at the beginning that your unit of analysis was at the um, firm level where you were grouping different uh, mm -hmm. VAT. So one one question I had about that is that um, I, I was just thinking in terms of um, you know what's the relevance um, labor markets like if it's a you know a regional labor markets that um, mm -hmm. you know you're grouping. Um, Firms across um, geography and also um, potentially, and also um, firms um, across um, maybe even different industries. So I just uh, was wondering whether you'd done. Uh, there you have. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I can begin. Oh yeah, maybe you can use like this. So the grouping of VAT typically the multiple VAT are the same similarities. They are just a lot of, of them are just the same the same address. They are just uh, specific parts of the company And they have different VAT? And they operate under different VATs. And then you have also you also have multiple plans across across Belgium, but that's a very tiny fraction of of, of, of those problems. Uh, typically, you will have some of that can have like 10 VAT numbers, but basically located in the same city, in the same, in the same street. Uh, so, you have this type of, of things. Um, some are just using multiple VAT account for tax reason, or just allocating one specific activity in one specific VAT. Yeah, so but it's not typically they stay in the same place. So it's not really about establishment. It's just that it comes, and some come from one for be given you know, for different activities. Yeah, but yeah. but in the end, most of the funds have just one to be and I think conditional on having one to be are average. So yeah, so yeah, that's the I wonder if there are any nonlinear non-linearities, right? Because I can imagine that maybe for some firms which are close to the maximum capacity, they try to hire more labor, but it's only a variable cost, right? But maybe some if, if the shock is large enough, they just open another plant or maybe I'm exaggerating, but opening a new line, and then they also have to pay this fixed cost, right? Maybe hire some additional managers, things like that. So is there any evidence that the elasticity is deeper depending on the size of the shock? Yeah, so 
So we did concrete, you know, some you know, robotics regarding that. But so far, we didn't find any like, significant difference. And yeah, I think a little bit tricky part about this is. Oh, yeah, so the short answer is like we didn't find any like, significant difference between a uh, small, the, I don't know. Uh, small shock and large shock. But so in terms of elasticity, that's a little tricky in terms of the conventions because, so, you know, small shock and large shock doesn't necessarily mean that a small stretch can be a large stretch. So basically, so, and also we have like a lot of like fixed circuit, intercity circuit, and public circuit. So, you know, what we are looking at is kind of the Change relative, so sales change relative to the industry of sales change. So, for example, we look at something like you know, large shock versus small shock, or like you know, positive shock versus negative shock, but that doesn't necessarily identify the response to like large sales change or you know, positive sales change. That's a little bit kind of tricky problem here. But like, you know, in terms of reduced form, we didn't see any like difference between like, you know, positive or negative shock, whether like, the large shock or the small shock. Yeah, related to your assumptions about that implied that they're constrained in the face of the shock is you assume that they cannot vary in the tourism model, right? But you know, if, if they could uh, keep the inventories of, of their inputs, then when the match up comes, sure they go and start buying buying what seems like a lot, but that's because they anticipate having to replenish inventories. But in terms of being constrained to produce, they could produce using using their stocks. Um have you thought of have you yeah, so so kind of like related to that, like so yeah, I have kind of so you, there are like kind of two points related to that. So one thing is like in our model, there is more no like a chapter or the industry ahead, but like for chapter is not there, but still chapter is there in some sense. The the reason is that if you pay you know to other fund for some like chapter input. That's just that other, you know, input participate in the VAT transaction. So, so some some of the robustness we did was you know, whether including the user cost of the capital or not. But you know that, but whether we do or not, the the way we kind of define the input participate kind of uh, incorporate the payments like kind of the capital. So, so in that sense, like you know, we see the you know, the same one to one response in input participate that kind of also increase like you know, payment to capital. And the second point is so the what we are the result that we are showing here is the again the response over the course of four years. And that is because like, you, know, you know we don't want to like you know kind of worry about like, some of like, the short-term response. You know, you know that was kind of more obvious in the labor side. You know, if you only look at the one year or two year response, the response is smaller. But you know presently that was because of some adjustment frictions. But so because we don't want to compute that with our you know, SPL of this overhead, we are we look at the permanent shock and also look at the response of the cost of four years. I, I hope that kind of alleviates some of the concerns about like you know capital and the justification. I didn't really understand what kind of work the data you have on workers, but I was uh, wondering whether you would do some kind of heterogeneous analysis on that, like by skills, by education, okay. tenure. Yeah, so for the work part of all, so the information we have is a little bit limited. We, you know, we don't observe occupation, but we observe something like blue color or white color. But in terms of the worker class, well, we also observe gender, male and female. But along that line, we didn't see any other difference in the okay. response. So both blue color and white color workers had similar response. Did you explore industry level heterogeneity? Because presumably the cost structures and technology. Yes, yes, very good, very interesting. Yeah, here, so we are looking at the elasticity in terms of you know, where you're buying from. And yeah, exactly. If you're buying from manufacturing, manufacturing good, manufacturing good come, you know, pretty much one to one elasticity. But if you are, say, buying from you know, some services, yeah, that has some global elasticity. But on aggregate, you know, in terms of the total input policies, you pay you, you know, all of your supply, you know, one of it is up to the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
We are leaving Belgium. Yeah, yeah. and I'll be shooting. Yeah. We're crafting and we're going south. It's, sorry, I think that one. I don't know. Yeah, I think it is. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. She's sorry. I don't think we're taking this one now. Yeah. yeah, no, it is. It is. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to the organizer for selecting our, our paper. <clears throat> so I'm going to present you our work in progress uh, and join work with Ariel Gurstein at UCLA and Gary Carrillo at the University of Michigan. <clears throat> I work at the Central Bank of Chile, so the usual is playing our advice. So, Oh, sorry. Uh, so the, this paper, uh, we're going to study a uh, long-standing question, which is what are the uh, welfare and efficiency costs of markups in the economy? So there's there's vast literature trying to understand this. So for instance, there is this paper uh, forthcoming in the JPE by Ekman and others that finds that basically markups have two main effects. One is that acts as a general tax, and the other thing is that it, it, it affects the uh, market dispersion and misallocation of factors of production. Uh, most of these papers uh, estimate market caps uh, under strong assumptions. So what we do to overcome that is that for the Chilean data that I'm going to speak in a minute, uh, we observe uh, specific and narrowly defined product codes. So once we, and for those codes, we observe different buyers buying different prices. And we are going to document that and then and then those wedges into a model to study some relevant culture function. So uh, what do we do is specific. So we are going to use firm to firm uh, data at the transaction level in Chile. And using these unique product codes and uh, product definitions that I'm going to speak in a minute, we're going to document price dispersion for inputs bought by Chilean firms. There's already some evidence uh, about uh, price dispersion at a product level, uh, and we're bringing in this, what we think is uh, a natural product code. And when, when, uh, uh, after we document that, <clears throat> we are going to have a model of firm-to-firm -firm network that's going to uh, require to, to have these changes in markups in order to study the counterfactual. We're never going to be able to observe or measure marginal costs, but because we're going to assume that those marginal costs are going to be constant within a product, any changes in prices are going to be changes in markets. And then we are, as I mentioned, we're going to study two contrafactions. The first one is to eliminate the dispersion across buyers within a product. And we're going to find that that has uh, uh, welfare gains of around uh, of up to seven seven percent from seven to from two to seven percent, and then we're going to do another counterfactual to study uh, to eliminate the dispersion now across products, even though we've already eliminated the dispersion within products across buyers, and we're going to find that those effects are of the same order of magnitude. <clears throat> so, uh, in the case of Chile, we have these electronic invoices. Which is basically a document that firm generates every time they sell to another firm. This is done for many reasons, like tax collection, but it's also used for firms for their accounting. And it's been uh, mandatory for all firms in Chile since 2017. This is collected by uh, the IRF and used by the Central Bank of Chile for several reasons, for several uses, such as like now casting and other policy work. So for each of these documents, electronic invoices, we have uh, many variables that we can see. So we have tax identifiers for buyer and seller. We have the locations from whether this is 
being uh, uh, sold or, or bought <clears throat> and their sectors. And then within each document, we observe each entry. So if, if, if they're selling more than one product, and for that, we can have a product description. So if you're selling a bottle of water, it's going to say bottle of water, and, but it's, it's going to be free text. They can, they can write whatever they want. <clears throat> and it's optional for them also to declare a product code. And we have these available in June 2021, which is going to be the month that we're going to use. And basically, this can be anything so simple as one six five, or it could be something more uh, standardized that I'm going to go into in a minute, and that we're going to use for some of those things. And, and, and also for each entry, if we have the quantity, the price, are any potential discounts from shortages that for that particular entry in the document. So how are we going to define a, a, a product? So we are going to focus for now only on products from the manufacturing sector. Uh, we're going to require those folks to be at least uh, uh, to have a length of at least three. Um, we are going to, because there could be different things that firms can do, we're going to focus on those products that have a unique product description within that code. And that within that, uh, and, and the same for the description. So within a description, there is just one code. Uh, and in the baseline, we're just going to focus on sales from the manufacturing sector to both manufacturing itself and retail, commerce in general, and with firms that have at least five employees. So how does the data that, 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 that we work with look like? Okay, I think that's it. Uh, so the first column, we have total sales uh, from the manufacturing sector. So you can see that those in one month, are, those are around 5 million documents with a total of 20 million entries. Um, we have well, those numbers of, of, of buyers and sellers. Then the, the sample that have, that, that have a ton of uh, this, this, this uh, product IDs that we, we define, uh, the, the sample goes down, but now we, we observe the, the number of products and the size of the network, which you can't see here, but it's around 5 million uh, of, of the product buyer, uh, uh, product buyer pairs. In our baseline, we kind of uh, use, uh, we get rid of very small firms. So the number of firms comes down substantially, but sales do not so much. So this is going to be the sample that we're going to be working with. Uh, and on the last column, as it's, it's called EL codes, and those are the uh, like gold standards when it comes to product definition. And so we're also going to do uh, a lot of robustness checks with those. Uh, there are a few reasons why we didn't go all the way with them. One is that it's uh, not, not all firms use EL codes, and in particular, some subsectors within manufacturing don't use them all. They use other types of codes. Uh, so, for instance, uh, something like metals and and chemicals, they don't, they don't use EM codes. Uh, so the first thing that I'd like to show you is how representative our sample that we work with is. So we do that in two ways. The first is to see how the expected shares in our sample compares to the one uh, official in the PPI in, given by the, the, the Institute of Statistics in Chile. And you can see that for that, that it, it seems to be pretty representative, has a large correlation. Well, they also add up to 100, so that, that also helps. But and, and, and food is slightly overrepresented because they're more likely to, to have product codes for, for their sales. The other way that we check whether our sample is representative is uh, to see uh, the implied inflation in our baseline, which is June 2021, compared to June 2022. And we can see that our inflation is very similar or close to similar to, to the official uh, inflation. Well, this is very inflationary year, so this is the reason why they're so large. And that has an, a correlation of 0.85. You can't see, but so, it's, so we're, we're like in a good path to, to, to we're working with a, with a good sample. In a way. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you different uh, measures of price dispersion within a product across buyers. So the first thing that we do is that we pull the data a little bit because we have a transaction level. So uh, we, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, pull it at the product buyer pair. And then what I'm going to show you, I'm going to focus in on all the, the products that have more than one buyer, that we call them the multi-buyer products. 
uh, which represents your baseline for one month around 50% of sales. Uh, so this is the, the sale rate distribution of the lock between the maximum price paid by a, by a, a buyer and the minimum price. And we can see that it's around the, the average is of 30%. Then we can compute the standard deviation within a buy, within a product across its buyers, and we can see that that's around 7%. Uh, interesting, like I, I think it's like 10% of sales, even though they have multiple buyers, they have very little price expression, but well, and, and, and then it grows. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you different samples. Of how this uh, uh, of how this dispersion is. So in this table, you can see well here the first column is is the, is the, is the baseline that I just showed you. Here now we have the unweighted distribution, which looks very similar. Then instead of pulling at this product by your level, we just uh, have them at the transaction level, and when we do that, well mechanically it's going to go up, uh, and it does go up, but just just very little. And in the, in the fourth column, we instead of pulling within one one, we, we pull these product buyer pairs at the uh, uh, three months level. So we use June to August. And again, it looks uh, very similar. We want to see how, how this has changed uh, with even higher inflation. I mean, what is high inflation in 2021, but it looks even higher in 2022. Uh, again, you can see that it, it only increases slightly. I'm oh, sorry, that is. Yes, it's pretty much the same. And finally, in the last column, we have the using EM codes. Yeah. So for EM codes, uh, which is going to be a, small, a, a, a considerably smaller sample, we have that dispersion is slightly higher, but still within the same order of magnitude. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you that there are other observables that, that have very little. Uh, Power in explaining this price difference. So the first one is going to be distant. So distant does indeed affect prices, but the explanatory power is very small. Like we have the within our squares when we run this regression that has a fixed effect at the product level, basically does not explain anything else of the, of the vari variation that we observe. Similarly, I can show you similar price dispersion. Uh, measures like I just showed you for the baseline and other samples, considering, uh, for instance, only the transactions that happen within Santiago, or uh, that, uh, or those that are very close and those that are very far away, and basically the main uh, uh, fact, uh, the, the the main average price expression does not change. Next, we want to make sure that, that there's there are not being many that's being offered. From the, uh, from the seller to the buyers. So there's no mapping between price and quantities. And one way to do that is to just run a regression with price on the left hand side and quantity on the right hand side at the transaction level. And again, uh, we see that once we control for this product buyer pair, the within R square is, is pretty small. Uh, another way to, to check this <clears throat> is to focus on, 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 on how is the the, the distribution of, of, of sales uh, of the quantities for, for different transactions within a product buyer pair. And we do this when prices do not move at all, or they move very little. So if there was if there were many of being offered to to, uh, to buyers, we would observe that if we have no price dispersion there, then we shouldn't have any quantity dispersion. But we see that when we do when, when, when prices do not change, basically we still have variation in quantities. Something similar that we, we can do if we, uh, instead of within a month, if we consider uh, from a month to the next one and see whether if prices do not change for a particular product buyer pair, what happens to quantities? And basically, again, we see that there is substantial uh, dispersion in those quantities. So <clears throat> I think I have like seven minutes left. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the, the model. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try to see what are the implications of this dispersion. So how important they are. So for now, we're gonna consider a fixed network of firm to firm trade. Uh, the goods is only are gonna be used as intermediates or as a final good consumption, final or for final consumption. We're going to assume that prices 
from uh, 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 from the of product I to a product I prime is going to be made of a markup that is going to be pair specific and a marginal cost that is just going to be specific to the product, right? And which is kind of like the main assumption that we're that we're making. The, the, the production of the final loop C is going to be aggregated with a CS technology and an assisted substitution problem. The production of each good is going to be made by a, uh, it's going to be made using uh, a, a productivity of IC, labor, which is, we're going to assume that it's fixed, and a bundle of intermediate inputs, which is going to be other materials being bought by the firm. The equilibrium is going to be pretty standard where goods markets and labor markets are going to be. So what is the first counterfactual we do is to, to see what are the welfare implications of eliminated price dispersion within a product and, and all, across all buyers. So we're going to define by this capital S the set of products with a product code. And we are going to have now that all firms, sorry, all buyers for a particular good are going to have the same uh, average market. So for that, we are going to, so that is going to be, this new markup is going to be a measure of revenue over cost. That's going to be the weighted average of those individual markups times those uh, weights that are going to be a quantity share weight. It's going to be a quantity weight. So what's going to be the new, uh, so, the, the, so that the, the change in markups is going to be given by the ratio between the old markup and the new. But we do not observe it. However, we can show that this variation in markups is just a function of prices and of, the, uh, and of these weights, and we can measure all of those in our data. For the other goods, for the other, in this case, firms that we don't have product codes, we are going to net those uh, markups to be the same. And also, the markets associated to final sales are also going to be constant. Uh, I think I have a lot of time to go into detail, but basically we have to calibrate a bunch of things and a bunch of shares. And for that, we combine and bring in another data also available at the bank, which is, for instance, this form 22, which basically tells a lot about their cost and employment and things like that. Uh, briefly, just a, a thing about, about, about the network. So basically we're gonna end up with 2000 firms that have these product codes, that gives us around 174,000 products. We have uh, other firms that are going to be retail firms, which are going to be almost 16,000. Uh, so this is going to give us a potential amount of product buyer pairs of more than 3 billion. Of course, not all, this, not all happen, but we still have uh, over 800,000 positive uh, things with positive sales. The only, the only relevant here aggregate statistics when it comes to the, just the one actually you can see, is, is uh, the intermediate sales with multiple buyers over total sales, which is going to be around 8% of, of, of our new market. So let me show you now the results. So <clears throat> these are going to be based on results, so as I mentioned. Uh, uh, just here, these are going to be the shot, the shot sales, because they're going to be the intermediate sales of them. That, that belong to this set of goods, the set of products that we have code and um, over the total set. So that's going to be in 8%. The, 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 the welfare increase of this is 0.17. But when we uh, scale it to, to how much we, we have chopped, chopped, it gives us around a 2% welfare gain of eliminating this market dispersion. If we go and have a higher elasticity, this goes up to a bit over 7%. What we can do next is we can use either the EM codes, and we can see that it is going to be slightly higher because, as I showed you earlier, it had a higher dispersion. We can also focus just in Santiago, where there is less dispersion, and therefore the the S, the, the rescale detector size is small, that the smaller side. Um, next, instead of using alternative examples, we can use alternative uh, parameterization. So if we allow uh, the the um, the, the, the elasticity between sectors to not be uh, to be uh, basically one. Uh, the, the the results are are, are very similar, and um, and finally we can also allow uh, uh, labor and materials to be uh, uh, to have elasticity at 0.5 and not be And then the, the results are again 
very, very similar, just in the same order of magnitude. Finally, um, the, we do a second counter factual. So now we are going to eliminate both the markup dispersion for giving good across its buyers, but also the markup between um, among products, right? So for that, we're gonna we're gonna set this new uh, uh, markup for each pair to be the same one, which is gonna be basically a measure of all the revenues in the economy over all the costs, right? And once again, we can do a similar trick that as I showed you earlier, where the changes in these markups to attain these, 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 these counterfactual is gonna be uh, uh, measured in things that we can actually see in the data. And again, this is not gonna affect those products and it's not gonna affect uh, the final sales product, the, the, final, the final sales uh, in the economy. There's another detail about the calibration because we're calibrating different things. So I'm going to need to show you something else. So this is what we had earlier. So we were uh, making, we're equating the uh, markups across buyers. Uh, then there's the same counterfactual, but with the calibration that we require for the second counterfactual. And again, uh, the effects are, are pretty uh, similar. I actually don't know the name of my measure, so I need to check look at that quick. Things like this. Yeah. And then here is what we <clears throat> finally, what happens when we had this, this second count factual. We see that welfare, the, 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 the rescale uh, welfare gains are about 5% to 15%. So if we wanted to know what's the effect of only uh, um, making markups. The same across products, it's going to be the difference between this 5.46 minus this 0.40, which is around 3%. And with that, we can say that the dispersion across buyers is uh, eliminated, the dispersion across buyers is slightly less important than the dispersion across products. Yeah, that is fine. So, okay, I'm just going to conclude. So, what we do here is to document. Uh, price dispersion for well narrowly defined products, which are inputs used by Julia firms. Uh, we show a bunch of checks that this is not going to uh, reflect trade costs, and that, for instance, it was not, it's not driven by inflation. And I just show you that the welfare gains for eliminating um, uh, markups across buyers within our products around is between 2 to 7%. And that is a very similar magnitude, but slightly higher when we eliminate this pressure across products. So, uh, that's it. Well, this is like an accounting exercise because in the model, markups, market dispersion is typically exogenous, right? So, when you say, when you look into factual to measure the welfare, for welfare implications of eliminating market dispersion, you kind of just like mean it in this specific sense. You're not because you don't model where market dispersion comes from, so you cannot really, you know, approach the welfare implications from the point of view of eliminating distortions that lead to the market dispersion in the first place. You're ignoring that, so that this is the kind of right that you should. Have. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Like we're not. Yeah, in the same line of what you're saying, we're not saying how like average markups, for instance, when you check the counterfactual will change if you eliminate, like we're just doing like a everything else constant kind of exercise. So we are, I, I don't know if that was your question. My question is, this is just an accounting exercise where you're ignoring the source of yeah. market dispersion across the buyer. No, and no. So related to, how does it look in the data? Does it, does it does does do markups across buyers really correlate with any observable yeah. or they look random? So yeah, so we do have actually certain certain things, but we are still working on those. So for instance, we try to see whether um the the, the, the here in this case of the prices they're gonna be the different markups or uh the product buyer pair changes with like the total quantity that firms may buy or with different measures of the size of the buyer. Right, but we don't want to, and this is why we should show it. We're still trying to understand how these uh, markups differences could be explained. Um, but it's definitely a good point. Yeah, in, right. in this sense, we're not talking anything. 
these are like wedges in a way that we are taking in the data and using it for our exercise. And you showed that the, the, quote, the, the size of the purchase matters, but you, I think you said that stuff is not important, right? But so when you show these uh, dispersions, um, you're not taking that out. You're not taking out the effect of, you know, are they bunching, are they, uh, you know, putting in bigger orders? It would be useful if you just report those statistics after you, when you, when you measure prices after you sort of pick out the effect of they're just getting bigger orders and getting discounted because of that. Because that, that would not be price discrimination, right? That would be just, yeah, a decision. No, thank you. Yeah, um, so my question is kind of related that um, it, it, it seems like you're assuming that if you get, you know, the, the getting rid of the dispersion in markups kind of maps once one into welfare, um, whereas, you know, may actually be optimal to have that dispersion. Um, you know, just bringing it back to my paper that, uh, you know, if, you know, by having a lower markup, um, you can get, you know, a, a sale to a superstar firm, you know, and there are spillovers, it may be optimal to, to have, you know, a different markup for, you know, certain buyers that other buyers. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's our concern, right? Because we're also, because that will bring into like having kind of, kind of like a dynamic problem is like your, you want to have all these benefits if I understood you correctly of selling to a superstar firm, so you might your price would be slightly like really different. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not doing that at the moment, uh, because we're using just for, for the welfare analysis, we're just using one month, so it's pretty static. Well, yes, but I'm just saying that it may still be off, like the, the welfare, the welfare gain may be overestimated because you know, you're, 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 you're in your model, you're assuming that you know, you can. In order to get wealthy games, you need to have the same markup for, for all your buyers. Yeah. Right. So I'm just saying that in, 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 there may be a world where that's not, not the case. Um, but um, just a, a very quick uh, clarification. It, it, um, so you were saying that you were assuming that um, marginal costs don't change? Is that? Do you you need a product for a month and um, over time. So the marginal cost is. It's, what do you mean over time? We just do one month. Oh, oh, okay. It's just okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's right. one month. It's just yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we are moving to defining so the product now is defined by that product ID and, and a seller. But we're now moving to trying to have other like locations and things that could define the product uh, within a month. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a similar question about discrimination, right? It can be that it's not the second view for discrimination. Maybe everyone just needs one wood, but people have different valuations. And so then it's optimal for <coughs> different prices. And by eliminating one, we don't really change that when people make it weird, right? Yeah, I think that's what we try to do with the quantities. I think that we, there's more we can do. Like there's this first, this, this, this paper on nonlinear pricing, which is basically like there's no linear pricing, differences in markups can be optimal. Uh, I think the only way that we're dealing with that right now is the quantity. Because so you see, right in this extreme example, you can imagine that it's not even dependent on quantity, it's just it's some unabsorbed purchases and buyers, and then you set different prices. But quantities are exactly the same for everyone. So. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, but, yeah. yeah, I don't have any good suggestions. How yeah, I don't have any good suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 we have to take it, I think it's, if it's, yeah, it's working for us, or we're still trying to go out of it. But, yes. Yeah. yeah, cool question. So it has uh, to a little bit with this previous discussion, but uh, like, but like, whether you can use your data in some way to kind of understand what drives dispersion, because kind of and how that translates to the model to sort of to understand like what would it then be kind of like a policy implication, uh, in, in the sense that you know is the price dispersion just capturing sort of like market power or are there other things? For example, you said you know Santiago, for example, has less sort of price dispersion than I think your your aggregate sample, yeah. but what's you know what do we learn from uh, from that fact? What, what so what's driving that? I don't know if uh, so. At, at least I didn't get from from the data part any sort of insight. What could be driving that? Do you mean the, the aggregate dispersion or yeah? I mean, we, we try to see whether it was like kind of the inflation, which is what we we count what it could be, and we kind of like ruled that out. Uh, it wasn't distance. So we, I didn't show you, like, basically we need to get slightly smaller, but that's kind of by construction. And then we also had, so whether it was, had to be distant, 
Uh, we're exploring now to do things because there are like certain variables about how the fluids are being delivered or in which terms of payment. So we're trying to kind of rule those things out. Um, uh, and then like the other thing would be like market power. Yeah. So in a way that the market, the, the market discretion can exist because there is market power. If there weren't, like I guess, we would have. Yeah, you said it's business better. How is the how is the, the distribution of the business by transaction in, in Chile? In Belgium, it's really really local. I mean, B two B transaction is the uh, at most. Uh, most of it is like between twenty five to fifty kilometers. The median. I don't have the number here. The median. The, the weighted median of distance. Uh, say weighted the uh, distance, the median of that distribution. I can't remember. It was like eight or twenty kilometers. So it was still, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you had like a, some outliers at the end, but most of it, like up until I think the percentile twenty five, it was like very, very little distance. Or actually, it was I think it was zero. I don't have it here, but we don't have it in this presentation. Yeah, that's just okay. then I guess those were trading remotely. Are also very specific. You know, they need a very big firms, right? Certain products. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Well, then we can move on to the last presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having us. So, uh, my name is from the DIS and here with me is the co-author Eric from the Asian community. And together, uh, we co-authored this paper together with Sally Chen and the DIS. Uh, our goal is to buy Canadian dependency and shock amplification through Global Valley Chains or NBC uh, using the uh, use case of early, early COVID lockdowns in the nuclear affected economies. So in this paper, uh, two main questions that we seek to uh, answer are using granular data uh, as two full questions. So uh, to study using network visualization and big data visualization tool uh, with this granular data to see whether the pandemic has shifted GDP interconnections uh, the two years following the onset of the pandemic. And also, we use this data to study empirically whether uh, participation of births in GDP amplified the uh, impact of shocks using COVID 19 as a defense study. So, our work builds upon a very rich academic literature uh, looking at the effect of GDP participation and the propagation of shocks. Uh, most of this work in the past has tended to focus on aggregated macro trade data. And more recently, uh, we see growing recognition of the importance of granular data and shedding uh, light on some of these topics at both the domestic and global level, and as shown by some amazing uh, work that was presented earlier today. Uh, we also built upon a paper by Xiaomi 2021 using granular data um, that found that GDP networks acted as an important propagation mechanism. Uh, China's early lockdown in 2022, the rest of the world. So, the value added of our paper includes the use of this granular data first to construct novel uh, network visualizations to study GDP network structure, as well as to create a over the pandemic, and also using an equity price model to empirically assess whether the impact of um, participation in GDP is amplified in the time of the lockdown. Uh, so just a quick summary of the data. So our primary data set that we rely on are firm level customer supplier information by standard and force capital IQ database. And this provides cross-sectional snapshots of customer supplier maintenance declared over a span of a two-year period. And this shows should be existence of a linkage, uh, but not the intensity of that linkage. And we <laughs> had two different snapshots in early 2020 and late 2021 with the aim of capturing pre and post pandemic state of GDP linkages. Um, and we look in particular at firms um, in three SIC industries, namely agriculture, mining, and manufacturing, because we aim to capture global goods manufacturing domain activity versus the ministry capturing raw goods suppliers. And we exclude, uh, for example, services. 
And also the location of these uh, firms are based on the firm's primary headquarters um, for Austin, as opposed to the ultimate parent headquarters as we aim to capture GBC on a locational basis. And then using this data, we then build out the work of John's paper and code the network visualization using an open source uh, network to work on the and um, probably the, uh, the charts, just um, some summary on how to interpret them. So in our charts, firms are depicted by nodes or dots, the size of which are proportional to a firm's overall importance in the network, which we measure by a densality measure called eigenvectors centrality. And we represent linkages between customers and suppliers by edges or connected line. And we use different colors to distinguish uh, different firm headquarter economies. And finally, we choose a network configuration where um, nodes sharing more connections are closer together. So you can interpret the chart as it with denser patches featuring a greater number of nodes and edges, suggesting more integrated networks and vice versa. So uh, these two diagrams here provide a bird's eye view of the full sample of this global GBC firm level network images. Uh, and we show the two sample periods with early 2020 on the left hand side and late 2021 on the right hand side. And here we use different colors to highlight uh, major uh, players in the global GBC, uh, including the US in blue, Europe in uh, green, uh, China in yellow, Japan in fuchsia, South Korea in red, and the rest of Asia in orange. And what immediately pops out is just the extent of complexity and interconnectedness um, of global value chains at the firm level. It's a bit hard to extract any specific observations, so later on we dive into the specific industry. But also just the mix of color throughout the network, showing you know U.S., European, Asian firms all intertwined throughout the entire network structure. And if we compare the change of these network structures over time, we can see that on the right hand side chart, it features uh, less more, less dense network structures because of the more empty space in the network diagram, suggesting that GBC significantly contracted over this two year period after the outbreak of the pandemic. And indeed, if we compare the change in the number of languages over time with this database, uh, they fell by around 30% over this two year period. So then we next dive into two uh, global manufacturing industries, the auto and IT manufacturing industry, to see whether they, their network structures can give some important observations. So here we show the auto manufacturing industry. And what you can see is this very unique modular um, uh, network structure with common patches of color showing us firms from the same economy trading amongst each other and then nested within the global auto supply chain, connected at the center with major multinational auto firms from the uh, Euro US and European economies, and I'm sure you can think of some of those major names in the auto industry. Uh, so this stuff, you have you know, Japanese firms in fuchsia in one patch, Chinese firms in yellow, Korean firms in red, and the rest of Asia on the right, all trading amongst each other, and then nested within this global circular auto supply chain. Um, and if we compare the change over time, we can see that while the chart on the right has there's some contraction of three speed, the overall structure of the auto supply chain remained intact, suggesting that it was relatively resilient uh, in terms of network shift to the equivalent shock. If we now turn on the other hand to the IT industry, we can see that in contrast to the auto industry, the IT industry features a much more decentralized and distributed network structure with firms from US, um, Korea, China, all intertwined throughout the entire network, uh, featured all around the source here, uh, without that sub nested modular structure that we saw in the auto industry. And um, these observations and comparisons suggest that um, relatively the auto industry may be more resilient to the shift or um, special firms leaving the supply chain or removal of the jurisdiction as they can capitalize on those modular regional or local network structures that they have established. Whereas IT firms, uh, removal of central firms or certain jurisdictions could rip up and they the entire supply chain or <coughs> network structure. And indeed, if you compare the change over time of the IT industry 
the right hand side chart at the end of 2021 features significantly less network structure. And indeed, the fall of linkages in the IT industry was significantly larger than that in the auto industry. And so uh, these charts show sort of an alternative way to look at this sort of level change in data. And also just the state of interconnectedness and complexity of global value chain and the importance of interregional and intercountry networks that likely acted as an important propagation mechanism of the COVID shock. And I now pass it on to my colleague, Eric, who will talk about our new model. Thank you. Thank you for so, uh, uh, hopefully, by now, uh, it will be uh, means that uh, the global value chains is a very complex and interconnected uh, 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 creature. So, uh, and the second part of our, our study tries to look at how uh, external shocks such as the COVID uh, within the lockdowns can propagate through these uh, GVC networks. In order to do so, we do make use of an event study approach uh, to try to uh, investigate how news of a COVID lockdown would have affect firms, uh, the equity prices of firms. To be more specific, we try to look at a list of uh, publicly listed firms. We examine the equity price to see whether those uh, firms with China or German linkages uh, uh, could be uh, more affected when there are news of a big lockdowns compared to those firms that do not have such linkages. So we choose China and Germany as uh, examples because uh, the two countries are major manufacturing hubs around the world. And so, and also uh, because they are relatively early stages to experience the COVID shocks. So that's why we, 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 chose, we chose this uh, two countries as a uh, as focal point of our study. Um, in order to uh, want to do the, the event study, we need to uh, pick the uh, sample uh, of the firm. <clears throat> and we also need to take a full grade uh, uh, state for the uh, event study, for the event mix. And in terms of the data, uh, we zoom in uh, in our um, uh, CRQ database uh, and to uh, only uh, take into account those firms that are probably need this uh, such that they have any prices available. And after doing this exercise, after we now all these private firms, we are left with around uh, uh, 21,000 firms worldwide. Uh, of which around 32% of them uh, have Chinese languages and 29% uh, of them have German languages. So it's, it's important to note that uh, these connections are not mutually exclusive. Uh, studies a firm that have connections with both China and the German. So um, for each firm in the sample, we first try to estimate where there is a bit of a linkage of, the, uh, of uh, that firm with the Chinese or the uh, German family market. And also, we will try to count uh, the position of firm uh, in, uh, uh, in the GVC language relative to, to that uh, chain in, in the same background. And uh, after uh, identifying the set of firms that we have, we will then uh, look at the, uh, uh, the, the event dates. We, we chose China, uh, we chose the 21st uh, of January and the 27th of January uh, for China, 2020 for China. And we chose the 16th of March for 2020 for Germany. That is because uh, those two days uh, in China were the days where the lockdown of Wuhan and the extension of the Chinese Lunar New Year holiday were announced. Whereas for Germany, we chose 16th of March uh, as the uh, event the study window day because uh, that was the date when Germany announced the uh, border closure due to the spread of the COVID virus. So, um, so here, uh, uh, I would just like to uh, first walk you through the, the, the basic, uh, the baseline regression of our model. So the left hand side is the uh, daily market return of the firms that we have in our sample. The right hand side uh, is the, the key variable of interest is this beta. Is this uh, beta? So this beta uh, coefficient uh, represents the coefficient uh, associated with uh, two dummy variables, lockdown and GVC. So for the lockdown variable, it takes on a value of one if it falls uh, uh, under either of three days that I just mentioned and several other ones. And for the GVC variable, uh, this is uh, this variable uh, takes on a value of one if the second firm has a linkage with a Chinese firm or a German firm and several other ones. Uh, also, in order to control for raw market movements and their impact on stock prices, we also uh, include the relevant uh, benchmark indices uh, for, for, for the uh, respective firms. 
Uh, one uh, uh, short remark uh, of this is that you may notice that uh, in this regression, we are not seeing uh, the uh, GC dummy and the log down dummy appearing as independent terms yet. That is because the uh, log down dummy and the GC dummies, they are not time varying, they are not uh, the firm varying, and as a result, they get absorbed by the uh, uh, time and firm. And this will also uh, carry over to our uh, later on the regression as well. Okay, so let me show you the uh, results uh, here. So, so here we go. Um, here, are, uh, uh, I would just like to highlight two points. First of all, uh, as uh, expected, we do see that uh, firms that are uh, led to China and to Germany suffer from uh, a greater uh, decline in equity prices after the, the announced lockdown measures compared to firms that do not have such benefits. This is uh, expected. And then for the second point that I would like to make out of this is that we observe that the decline in, uh, in uh, firms that have German interests seem to be larger than that of those with China interests. Our conjecture is that because right at the beginning of the COVID uh, uh, crisis, uh, people, the investors were not very uh, good at ascertaining how, just how bad the situation could be. There is still, by the, by the time that Germany uh, announced lockdown measures in March 2020, uh, the investors in, around the world kind of have a good idea of, of what the COVID might be. And so, as a result, it reacted more uh, as a result. And in the uh, economic news slides, uh, uh, they represent extensions of our model. And so, let's just look uh, here. Um, first of all, uh, the first extension of our model is to look at whether the position of a firm. Uh, along the supply chain, relative to a Chinese firm or a German firm, matters uh, for investment perception. Uh, we do find that, uh, whereas for the case of the uh, so in, in this, we, we, we try to modi modify our uh, regression uh, so that we introduce a upstream down variable and a downstream down variable. So here we means that it takes on a value one for, down, uh, for upstream. Uh, if a firm is upstream to, is a upstream supplier to either a Chinese firm or a German firm. And for downstream, it's just the opposite. That means it takes out a value of one if it's, 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 uh, if it's a customer to a Chinese firm or to a uh, German firm. So uh, the, the, the result is uh, more or less uh, uh, consistent with my previous slide, uh, with the, uh, the, the impact of the Chinese uh, uh, linkages to be uh, relatively small compared to those Germany. But just one uh, 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 interesting finding is that whereas for the, uh, the case for upstream versus downstream, for Chinese firms are more or less the same. There is a, a notable differentiation by investors uh, between upstream linkages, downstream linkages. With those uh, firms that are downstream to, to, to uh, Germany, uh, experiencing a much larger uh, decline in, in, in what they saw uh, compared to those upstream. So, why, why are there such differences? And we think it's worthwhile for us to go uh, into looking at this total differences. In order to do this, uh, we we further expand our, our, our regression model so that it now uh, we now look at um, uh, uh, two terms. So here uh, again, uh, the left hand side is is the same. There is the, the right hand side row. Now we we look at the seconds. Uh, in, in particular, I would like to draw attention to these two terms: uh, the beta as well as the gamma here. The beta term uh, is a coefficient associated with uh, the impression type of two where, uh, dummies. The first one is the log of dummy, as we just defined, whereas this new dummy variable called SECA is the CICS um, uh, categorical variable, which uh, we try to uh, categorize uh, the SECA to which the sample term belongs to. And another uh, interaction term here, where, which is associated with a gamma, is actually a triple interaction term. So this triple interaction term is the lockdown dummy cross the second dummy cross GZ dummy. So how to interpret this is a little bit clumsy, but, but uh, in a nutshell, this beta tries to capture the unconditional uh, average uh, second return uh, 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 following the use of a COVID lockdown. Whereas for the gamma coefficient, it captures the additional impact uh, on the second uh, second return. Uh, given these linkages to China or Germany. And so here, uh, this gamma coefficient would like represent the additional in impact to the firms that are linked to either China or Germany uh, after the blood news of the long time. 
So here, uh, for, this, for the sake of time, I would just like to draw your attention to the right hand panel, which shows the conditions to deal with uh, this gun. So I highlighted uh, four industries here, all of which is okay. So uh, three of them are uh, highlighted in red, which are consumer discretionary, industrial, and information technology. So I highlighted them in red because they under control relative to the rest of the teams. So uh, our conjecture is that because these sectors are either highly susceptible uh, to the uh, high sensitivity to demand, uh, such as consumer discretionary, like in this industrials, or because they are very sensitive to any supply chain disruptions, say, for example, to the information technology. So, uh, uh, so that's why we are seeing that uh, the firms tend to underperform uh, one of these. And by the way, so this result we might have shown is for the case of German lockdowns. So for the China lockdown, the results are similar. So I'm not, I'm not sure. And on the other hand, so we, we, we saw the healthcare sector actually outperform um, uh, in the peers uh, following the news of Germany uh, border closure. This is because we, we projected that as investors uh, expect that there is going to be a larger demand for uh, healthcare products and uh, medical services for the lockdown measures. So these healthcare sector actually outperform relative to other sectors. So this uh, uh, sort of explains why there, there was some uh, differences in number of three and last three languages out there, because uh, these uh, the relatively good performance of Australian years can be thought of to be healthcare within the firms that are selling medical products to Germany. So they uh, decline by a relatively less extent compared to the others. And we are able to, I, 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 sorry that I, I did a bit of running out of time, but uh, I will try to wrap up very, very soon. Um, so this is just a, a, a summary of what I said uh, over the road. And finally, um, we also find that uh, uh, just a lot, uh, just like uh, what the teacher has uh, done in uh, we do find that the, um, the impact of a external uh, shock uh, on the allowing supply chain has been distant with increasing business. Say, for example, when we look at the, the case of uh, German lockdowns for the uh, with the uh, name of business. So, for firms for that are either upstream or downstream for a German firm, and when there is an announcement of German uh, for the lockdown, firms that are directly connected to a German firm tends to be hit the hardest, which is the, uh, uh, the blue bar here. But then firms that are connected at the second level, the, the orange bar, and the or third level, which is the gray bar, they actually suffer very less impact due to the, the, the COVID lockdown news. So this is indeed uh, aligned uh, in line with the existing literature that shows that usually the external shocks tend to dissipate along a supply chain. Okay, so uh, let me conclude uh, with uh, our uh, findings here. So first of all, we would like to uh, show you that uh, TMC networks are indeed very complex, and so there is a much necessity for us to go granular to look at firm level data. It's because firm level linkages tend to uh, have some aggregate impacts on the GDC data that we can see that we cannot have by looking at the aggregate train flow data. So that's why it's a good idea for us to go deeper into the, the data set. And also, uh, just as uh, uh, illustrated by uh, the ends, uh, uh, several diagrams, we show that some kind of, uh, some sectors which are carefully intensive, like IT and autos, they do they are not very mobile in terms of the uh, movement and capital and labor and so on. And so, uh, even though after two years after the pandemic, we are seeing relatively little changes over there. Uh, and, and, and so, the, the story of decoupling is, is a little bit far um, uh, fetched, at least in the short term. And also, uh, our uh, regression analysis shows that TMC landscape can require shocks along its pipeline. Uh, and along this, hopefully, I can convince you that uh, for, for that uh, dimensions, both the nature of the shock matter as a sectoral uh, performance will also matter in terms of how shocks get propagated along the GDP chains. So, uh, and finally, last of the problem, no, but last but not least, so our findings also uh, is also consistent with the existing literature that the uh, shock of the uh, external impact on the GDC chain and this is the increasing the risk. So here is all that we would like to share with you. And uh, any questions, comments, I'm Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 So I, I wonder if you thought of, about creating a, a variable, like 
like instead of just measuring say total exposure like because your variable measures exposure either to to uh, uh china or or yeah. germany yeah. one that measures say diversification to to to, to many manufacturing uh, spots so that you could actually capture uh, whether more diversified firms could suffer less from these shocks Yes, this is actually a very interesting uh, point that uh, we we we, uh, we we have thought about uh, in, in in doing this. But then, uh, uh, because we we were having some difficulties in in, in actually making it, because for 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 the CIO database, uh, we are relatively 